Yeah, okay, uh, let's, get back, let's get back to the last session of the meeting, uh, and we need to be on time because um, one of the speakers will be catching a flight right after the session. So the last session... And so, Chair, uh, so uh, I have the great pleasure to, to chair this session. Uh, will tell us, you know, since I'm the I'm going to introduce this session, but I don't have the responsibility of being speaker. I can say that they will finally tell us how to transform everything of this into action. <laughs> now, I think it's a tough job. And, and, uh, but anyway, so the title of this session, as you see, is Building Better Science Policy Interfaces for Poverty Eradication and Inequality Reduction. We have four very nice speakers. Daya Reddy is uh, president of the International Science Council. Uh, Volker Termoylen is president of the Interacademy Partnership. Uh, William Cole Glazier is uh, 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 editor in chief, actually, of Science and Diplomacy and senior scholar in the Center for Science Diplomacy at the American Association of Science. I should add that he served as the fourth science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State from 2011 to 2014. So you should know how to transform this into action. And, and Rashid Bajwa, I don't know if I mentioned the name correctly, is the leader of the National Rural Support Program in Pakistan, and also he leads uh, a, a very important microfinancing uh, program in, in, in Pakistan. So that could be an example of a possible action towards uh, poverty, I guess. So. Uh, Uh, the first question is really related to the uh, abstract of this uh, session. Uh, how to strengthen linkages between scientific knowledge and the policy process? Uh, of course, we could have success examples uh, and also some comments on future action, if possible. Uh, and then, of course, there is a second question I think many people have raised here. We had three days of very fruitful discussions on science for reduction of poverty and equality. So a big question, where do we go from now? Uh, we are going to go home, and, and, and then, and then, what comes after that? Yeah? And I think we'll have some suggestions uh, about it. So that's the, the problem of this meeting. Just to provoke you, I would like to, and since I'll not have another chance to say it, uh, I'll just like to show one example from Brazil uh, of mobilizing the society, and that was the fourth national conference on science and technology and innovation for a sustainable development that happened in 2010. It was celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Ministry of Science and Technology in Brazil. Well, this conference mobilized lots of people. In fact, uh, it, it was held during three days in Brasilia. It had 4,000 participants, more than 40,000 internet accesses. It was preceded by five big regional conferences, 24 conferences at the state level, and six thematic seminars. This is the president of Brazil at that time, and he opened the conference. So the point I want to make, and also from this conference, it was produced this blue book, you know, after the conference, it took about six months to produce this book. We had representatives from several, I mean, all sectors of society, you know, industry, uh, agriculture, uh, Indians, uh, government, academy, uh, syndicates. Uh, uh, so, you know, they were all there discussing science, technology, innovation, and what uh, we could do about that. So I think it was a very important moment and an example of something we could do to mobilize society. Of course, the government uh, should want to, to bet on it, 
<laughs> in other words, the government called for a conference of this kind, and I was the coordinator of that conference at that time. So it was a, a very interesting experience uh, about the, bo uh, the, the Blue Book. Some of the recommendations were implemented, for instance, a legal framework for science and technology, facilitating cooperation between academy and business that passed, the, that was approved by the Congress, and also a biodiversity law which established a legal framework for biodiversity related research. So, just an example, I believe that we will learn other examples as well, but I think we should look forward to, to things like this, just not uh, talking for the among us, but reaching society, reaching other sectors of society and making them aware of the importance of science and technology for their daily life and for the work as well. So uh, that being said, I would like to call Daya ready for the first uh, speech. Well, uh, thank you very much, Luis, and really thank you in particular for the invitation to participate in this truly fascinating meeting. I've learned such a lot over the last uh, day and a half. Unfortunately, I missed day one. Um, oops. So, uh, right. Um, I want to really start off at, at perhaps a a point which is uh, rather too obvious for this group by highlighting the, the two uh, SDG goals that are the focus of this meeting, but also to, to include goal number three on, on health. Um, because a little further down in my talk, I want to talk about interactions amongst the different goals. Um, so with regard to inequality, again, this may well be familiar to this audience, but nevertheless, it's not a bad idea to touch base with some of the, if you like, the, the, the more stark figures associated with inequality. Um, for example, on the left-hand side, that um, some 20% of the people in the world own 80% of the wealth. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, an extract from a report by Oxfam, it's a 2016 report, but I don't think too much has changed. Um, this is a quote from up above here, indicating that the wealth of the poorest half of the world's population has fallen, in fact, by 38%, well, had fallen over the period 2010 to 2016. Um, if I could turn to health and, and to uh, also just provide a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, because that's where I come from. I come from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, we heard in, I guess, in Tola's talk this morning about uh, some aspects of both infectious and non-communicable diseases. The point of this slide over here really is not so much to make any points about HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, but rather to look at this curve over here, which tells us something about non-communicable diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. One thinks health and so on in sub-Saharan Africa, HIV and TB and so on come to mind immediately. But have a look at the dramatic increase in, for example, different cancers, cardiovascular disease, daily is the disability adjusted life years, um, really dramatic and yet um, the World Health Organization is perhaps responding not as rapidly as it should to uh, funding for work on, on non-communicable diseases. Um, this picture over here uh, shows us something, well, it shows us a relationship between life expectancy in years, so again, health-related, um, against income per person, so again, roughly speaking, inequality. And uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, graph or picture because you could, with some exceptions, of course, more or less put a straight line through here, showing the correlation between life expectancy and income per person. The, uh, the sizes of these disks here give an indication of the populations. Well, 
And then just a, uh, finally a word, a very quick word about urbanization, again, which we heard something about this morning. Um, and again, by way of indicating that, uh, that really one has to consider the, st the sustainable development goals in an integrated way, um, bearing in mind the interactions, one has to develop an understanding of the interactions between the different goals. And, um, and here we, we see some detail of what we are witnessing, what we have been witnessing as a global population with regard to urbanization, growth in the number of mega cities, and then there are a number of problems that um, are associated with urbanization, but there are opportunities as well, for example, in, re in relation to provision of health services and other services. So, um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the International Science Council, so let me, before I continue, just say a word or two about the Council. It was formed uh, as the merger between ICSU, the International Council for Science, and the International Social Science Council. Uh, ICSU had been in existence since 1931, and the Social Science Council since the 1950s. So the merger took place last July, and the result is an organization uh, comprising 140 or so uh, national and regional organizations. So the Brazilian Academy is a member of the International Science Council, other academies or funding councils and the like of different countries. And then in addition, we have just over 40 international scientific associations. And very importantly and relevantly, these straddle the natural and the social science, uh, natural and social sciences. I've just shown pictures of, of a few here in an attempt to give you an idea of the range of, um, of international scientific bodies. What does the Council do? Very roughly, um, there's an enormous amount of science for policy work that we undertake, as well as policy for science, shaping policies and practices for our community, for the, for the scientific community, whether to do with funding, whether to do with publishing guidelines, and the like, and then also uh, we have an active role in relation to freedom and responsibility yeah. in science. Yeah. Well, um, how do we go, how does the International Science Council go about its work? So I, I want to focus on science for policy since this is what this session is all about. Just to mention one example, um, in relation to the SDGs, much of the work that we undertake there um, is, uh, well, finds its way to what's called the STI major group. There are a number of major groups that advise the high-level political forum, which is the forum comprising United Nations member states, uh, convened for the purpose of engaging with the SDGs. And uh, together with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, we um, represent the science technology communities, uh, make the case for integrated science in public policy. And then we also mobilize and organize uh, scientific input into the UN process in various ways. Um, I want to turn now to some specific examples of, of work, that are, work that is of particular relevance to what we're talking about here. So this is a study, it does go back to before the formation of the Science Council, but work undertaken by our two predecessor organizations, um, which is a review of the 169 targets um, of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And it's, it's quite a sobering analysis and review. Um, for example, only 29% of these targets were found to be well-defined uh, and based on the li latest scientific evidence. Uh, almost half or just over half uh, need more work. And 17% are weak in the sense that they either were deemed to be unnecessary or to duplicate other, other targets. The review, um, the authors of the review went on to write about, well, you know, what, what exactly should we be doing? So we being the scientific community, uh, so that we understand exactly what the SDGs are all about and that we can advise policymakers and other members of the scientific community, in fact, everybody who is engaged in the SDGs 
on how to approach the goals and the targets, and how do we, furthermore, how do we improve them? So here's a long list, I won't read through all of them, but um, for example, designing practical metrics for actually tracking progress in a quantitative way, uh, monitoring mechanisms, um, evaluating progress, for example, through peer review, enhancing infrastructure, and here I've, I've highlighted data-related infrastructure, which is extremely important in any process aimed at, uh, at implementation and then assessment further down the track. Um, and then right at the bottom, uh, you know, a, a point which I felt I should highlight, we've seen it in our papers as well, whatever we are talking about, um, let's just ask some practical questions about what this means, particularly for low-income countries, countries in the developing world, with regard to the capacity to undertake such work, to, to implement it, to engage with policymakers as well at the national level. We, we can't simply leave it at this point. We, it is our responsibility to understand and to determine how to take that next step. Um, uh, another publication is on SDG interactions, and this brings me to a point that I mentioned right at the beginning. The fact that the, the Sustainable Development Goals represent a particular way of organizing or packaging a number of, of goals. They could have been organized differently, and they are most definitely not independent of each other. There are major, there are strong interactions, um, there are potential synergies, and there are, there are potential trade-offs as well, which, we, again, we need to understand if we are going to be able to engage in addressing these goals effectively and not with any unintended consequences. This is also a highly complex process, and th this uh, publication here represented a start in a way by taking a few goals and examining very carefully the interactions. So this brings me to um, a current project. It's not underway yet. We are hoping to get going with it uh, sometime this year with a number of partners who are shown here, EASA, International Network for Government Advice, the United Nations Development Program, uh, the Stockholm Environmental Institute, and I'm afraid I must apologize for the fact that I've omitted the logo of the JRC, the Joint Research Council of the European Commission, which is also a, a partner. So the point of this really is to take the previous study to another level and to, well, starting as a point of departure with an observation, and one may debate this, but an observation that the SDGs are approached to a large extent as a reporting mechanism rather than something which ought to drive policy. What do we do about it? So the aim of the project will be to develop an online tool which will systematically analyze key interactions, do various mappings, and then connect these to national processes. Um, the dissemination will take place in various ways, certainly through the UN bodies, relevant bodies, and also through, through member organizations. Um, I want to finish off, um, you know, and I'm, I put the slide together later this morning um, after listening to, listening to the talks earlier, and, and particularly the, the discussion around Africa and uh, you know, and, and, and a view which I, I do agree with, uh, certainly a traditional view of Africa being told what to do, being helped to do this, being shown the next step in the life. This is um, the African Open Science Platform, which is an outstanding example of how a continent, or part of a continent anyway, has engaged, certainly with partners from elsewhere in the world, in getting up to speed a um, state-of-the-art uh, network, the aim of which will be to promote the use of data uh, underpinned by principles of open access um, and really finding its way through to data-driven science. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this is perhaps not all that clear, but it shows the number of, of uh, components of what is a federated network, federated in a geographical sense, 
and in other ways as well. So you have a combination of data science institutes, you have infrastructure, shared infrastructure, and most importantly, of course, capacity building, training and skills, um, development, um, training around transdisciplinary research and the like. This is something which has been developed in Africa. There are 11 countries that are collaborating now, and as the months go by, uh, the program, the platform is seeing the addition of, uh, of other African countries from sub-Saharan Africa to this. So this is really uh, intended just to give an indication of what can be done if we put our minds to it and engage ultimately in, in a real partnership with organizations in Europe and in North America, also in the world, that are undertaking um, open science related developments of, of this kind. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, sure. Thank you very much, Daria, for a very interesting talk. Uh, so, uh, Folker, would you like to give us some words on this? <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here. And although you see on this wonderful shine there, IAP in the corner next on the same level as the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, I must admit we have not done anything for this wonderful meeting, which I enjoyed very much. I'm very proud of your academy. I'm very proud, you know, about the, the level of, of presentation we have heard, and it was a wonderful experience. So I think. You told us, Luis, that we should give some examples of, um, of work we have done to see whether it was effective or not effective. Now, before I became a president of this uh, IAP, and I will explain what is IAP in a moment, we had the, a, a, a question from the United Nations at the, at the time, must have been when uh, uh, Robert Dijkgraaf was our president, to to give advice to the IPCC as far as the governance. In agriculture, does it work here? So, and I assume that uh, a number of you don't know what is IAP, so let me just explain to you. IAP is a network, a global network of science academy, which was founded in 1993, and ever since it has, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has reorganized its structure. And the present structure is that we have over 130 member academies from about uh, 128 countries. And uh, these member academies have formed in the different continents, regional networks in Europe, and in the Americas, in Africa, and in Asia. These regional networks work independently, but still belong to IAP and they do work according to their bylaws and their statutes and their objectives, and are quite active. And then you see th three green boxes, health, science, and research reports. These are commissions, committees, which we have established out of the 130 member academies, which we deal with specific questions which are come up to IAP and for which we need a group which is competent to deal with this. So we have one group on health, 
We have one group on science, and we have one group which is called research reports, but it, in particular, they're, they're doing policy work. If policy questions coming up, they are capable of handling it. And above this, you would see a blue box, and this is a board, and in this board, all these groups are represented, all together are 10 people, and they try to We will provide science advice to policymakers. We strengthen the global science enterprise. We have a lot of activity in science education and towards the scientific literate global citizenry. And of course, we have done a lot of work in helping new science academies to, to start in different countries. And in, just to give you a figure, in about 2000, we had eight African academies. And now we have 24, 26, Mohammed, you have to correct me if, if this is even more. So there has been a, a lot of changes during the last 18 years. Now, challenge for food and nutrition security. I don't want to talk about food because we had so many discussions here about food and nutrition security and agriculture that you are all familiar with it. You are all expert and I'm not an expert. But this topic came up about three years ago at IAP, and it was discussed, shouldn't the academies take up this issue and work on it? And in former times, what happened is that we always were creating a working group of about 15 or 20 people from the different continents, and they will work on an issue. But this time we decided this is not good enough. This is such a broad topic, which has so many different sides and so many different objectives and so many different problems. It would be much better if we would create working groups really in the different regional networks and give them, you know, and ask them to work on an issue so that we get four reports out from these four regional networks, which then would be a basis to make out of these four reports a fifth report, a global report, in which we compare what these uh, colleagues have worked on. So, what we did is that we, sorry, that we asked them to develop working groups and we came together before we started the work to agree on a scheme. We needed a template. But the idea was we only can compare the work which is done on the different continents if we would have a template which everybody would follow. And this template would give us the possibility that after these reports have been worked up according to the template, we would have a basis on which we can compare answers to questions. So what are these questions? So I have a list here of 10 major questions we all agreed upon. This is, what are the key elements to cover in describing national regional characteristic of FNSA? What are major challenges, opportunities for FNSA and proje projections of the regions? What are strengths and weaknesses of science and technology at national, regional level? What are the prospects for innovation to improve agriculture at the farm scale? What are the prospects for increasing efficiency in food system? What are the public health and nutrition issues, particularly with regard to impact of dietary change on food and demand and health? What is the competition for arable land use? What are other major environmental issues associated with FNSA at the landscape? What may be the impact of national, regional regulatory frameworks and other sectorial, intersectorial public policy on FNSA? And what are some of the implications for inter-regional global net levels? All these, these questions had a number of subheadings, which I will not go into this. So there is a lot of questions and of course, we ask them, address this question from the point of science, from the point of research. What could research do, if we do the research, to improve the situation? This was our major goal, which would bring everybody together, and everybody had to do this. So in these two and a half years, we had a lot of meetings, we had workshops, different workshops in different countries. They were separated from the other. And we, in between, we always came together and exchanged views and made sure 
that really the work was progressing and if problem was coming up, we were helping to organize things. All this was financially supported by my government, by the Ministry of Science and Education, because they had great interest that we would exercise this, because they would like to know, is science really in the position to help? Is, is this possible if we include everybody globally from the science academy that there, there is an output which is more than if, we, if it would be done by a working group consisting of 20 people. So this work has been published and after this publication of these four works, and I have to admit, I have to tell since we are here now in Brazil, that the network of the uh, American, the North and the South American academies, they did something in addition to it. They had to started with a huge workshop, and then they had asked each of their member academies, I think these are 24 or 26, to answer these 10 questions independently. Each does it on its own. And then they published a book of 600 pages, and out what they had accumulated, they then made a summary out of about 50, 60, 70 pages, which then was a basis for us. This was done in ESAC, at the, at the European um, network, to make a summary report out of it, a synopsis of what has been given. In other words, if you have your question five with all the subheadings, what are the answers in Africa? What are the answers in Asia? What are the answers in Europe and the Americas? And if you do this and bring this together, you get a global report. And as this, I think, can explain the, poli the politics, why is an uh, answer different? Wh why does this happen that you don't get a single answer to a single question? And that is, it differs from continent to continent. And this, this report has, in, has been uh, published. It was published a couple of months ago, it's in, I think in December last year. And we got a lot of requests to, for p participation in, uh, in meetings. So we were invited, Mohammed mentioned this already before. Of meeting this European sign, open forum meeting, an equivalent to Triple AS. We were at Triple AS. We, uh, in February, we were at the IPFRA, IPFRA Institute, the International Science Food Policy Institute in Washington, and gave a talk. We had discussion with representatives from, from the World Bank. We uh, ha are having about a number of papers in, uh, in press, in journals, in particular in Lancet, Planetary Health, and we also have some papers uh, in, uh, in food journals. So in other words, we are trying to really bring it to society, bring it to science. And it was of interest that we got many questions that uh, we had to answer in the meantime. Now, this does not come from, from alone. You know, if you just have the reports and you make a launch to, let's say, to policymakers and you do not follow it up, this is not enough. It is very important that what we learn that from the very beginning you have to engage competent journalists. Journalists who have interest in this issue, which participate, this costs money of course, but which participate over the, the months and help you from the very beginning, you know, to interact with important journals or interact with newspapers. For example, we have this interaction with the New York Times, with the Independence, with the Guardian in, in England, with the Le Mans in France, with the Frankfurter Allgemeine in Germany, with, with newspapers in Australia. We were surprised how well this works. This cannot be done by scientists. We are not good enough in this. Then we had, of course, social media. I'm too old for this, but this was done by youngsters from the academy and they helped and also by, by this journalist. This is, I think, quite important. But what was also important is that from the very beginning we interacted with po po politicians we knew personally and in particular
network because we had given a number of good quality advice in genome editing, CRISPR. who was coordinating this was always very happy the response So uh, we now have uh, uh, William Cole Glazier, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, okay, <laughs> from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Thank you very much for coming. Well, this has been a wonderful conference. Uh, I want to thank the organizers and all the speakers. I've learned a tremendous amount here. I, I feel fortunate as the one American that got to come and listen to, uh, uh, to all of you. It, what I'm going to focus on is a, building a better science policy interface to stimulate action. I think that's what all of us are really trying to uh, accomplish. And uh, I really started out life as a theoretical physicist and a university professor, but the I spent the last three decades actually in this science policy interface, which is almost like being a postdoc again. But I did uh, at least in three different uh, assignments, one for almost two decades overseeing the studies done by the U.S. National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, policy studies, uh, which has turned out now to be a big enterprise, roughly 200 studies a year, done on every kind of issue you can think of where information from science, engineering, medicine, technology is relevant. The U.S. government pays for maybe 70 percent of them, but the studies are done totally independently of, uh, of government control. So it's sort of been an exercise over more than 150 years in kind of the science policy interface in this role. Uh, the second assignment was serving, as you heard, as the science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. So that was going into a totally new world for me in the science and diplomacy. It had the benefit of interacting with many countries about science and technology. I was there for, for three years, 2011 to 2014. The most striking thing to me was every country that I interacted with, which was over 70 on science and technology, no matter it was a developing country or the most developed advanced technology country, they always focused on 
one issue first of all, and this was absolutely true with every case, how in their own country they may build their capacities in science, technology, and innovation. Uh, all countries now see that as essential for their security, for their prosperity, for their competitiveness, uh, for surviving in the, uh, in the 21st century. In, in my last uh, assignment for two years, I, I co-chaired uh, an uh, advisory group appointed by the UN Secretary General on the role of science, technology, and innovation for a fascinating learning experience, and for me anyway, in the way uh, that the UN works. So let me, I'm going to talk about uh, my message is mainly for the science communities at the national level and countries, which certainly includes the academies, but there are aspects of, of, of poverty and reducing uh, inequalities. And uh, so you could take these as three examples, although I think they are particularly important. I listed the three of the targets and, and two from SDG number one and one from SDG number 10, which sort of encapsulates aspects of these three issues. We heard the, the excellent talk in the last section about social protection systems. Uh, the safety net. We also heard in the talk Monday afternoon about the development experience in Brazil and how Brazil made great progress in terms of both reducing poverty and reducing inequality by focusing on a combination of policies and strategies addressing both the social protection system such as income transfers as well as trying to increase employment opportunities, income generating opportunities for the poor. Uh, and it was the combination of these two that made uh, progress Although there were challenges, they found that the, the new work that generated uh, income uh, for the very poor at the bottom, there was not a significant increase in productivity, which over the long term could, could create problems. Uh, so the combination of, of the two, looking at the income generating opportunities for the people at the bottom, as well as the social protection system, which we heard earlier in the last session, they can't just be for one part of life, they really have to look at it as a system throughout the lifetime of, of the individual. Uh, in, that, in the one on target 1.8, sl uh, development strategies for countries, how important that is, not only for trying to improve the overall prosperity of the country, but also the prosperity and the growth of, uh, of people at the, uh, the bottom. So, so what are the tools that I want to emphasize in terms of how the, the science communities at the national level can help to really attack these issues uh, with their, not only their governments, but all sectors of their society. So I want to emphasize, uh, emphasize three of them. Uh, one of the first one I'll call policy studies. You, the, uh, the work that the U.S. National Academies do in sort of looking at public policy issues in the U.S., you could classify as, uh, as policy studies. They're really trying to apply the insights and knowledge from science, technology, medicine to actually look at how you can affect change, stimulate action, uh, how you can evaluate what's working, what's not working, uh, to make a difference and make recommendations for how to improve things. The, uh, the, the second one on, uh, goes by this catchy name, Roadmaps. Roadmaps comes from the technology sector. The, the semiconductor industry developed roadmaps for trying to continue Moore's Law. Uh, but all it really is is a, an action plan that actually gets changed and improved over time because you continue to evaluate you have ultimate goals you're trying to reach. You propose actions based on evidence that you have at the time. You, when you evaluate how it's working, then you make appropriate changes and continue trying to reach the goals you've set out. And I'll talk in part about 
roadmaps at the national level, but roadmaps are in part at every level, the global level, the subnational level, the local level. I think they're also very important, actually. It's an institutional level, and I'll talk about the role of what we call science, technology, innovation for the SDGs roadmaps. In, in the last issue, disruptive innovation, I think all of us realize how fast science and technology are moving, incredible speed. We see large companies that emerge that no one had heard about uh, a decade ago, creating great opportunities, all the different technologies, which uh, many of you are, are familiar with, from AI, robotics, uh, big data, uh, gene editing, et cetera. But one thing, and I know we discussed some of this in earlier sessions of the conference, but I think maybe what was underestimated in my view is that the downsides of some of these technologies actually are creating a lot of concern. Certainly in my country, the United States, we're worried now about the manipulation of social media and fake news and the implication, a lot of concern about the implications of robotics and AI on employment. I'm still an optimist and believe that there are tremendous opportunities created by these new technologies that are moving so fast, but we also have to spend as much time thinking about the downsides, how we mitigate them, how we deal prevent the, uh, the negative things from happening from these rapid technological advances. So let me start just with policy studies, and what I'm going to show you is just the book covers. Uh, I mentioned all these studies by the U.S. Academy, and then in science at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences includes not only the natural sciences, but also the social sciences. And for the studies that are addressing really the issue of poverty reduction and reducing inequalities at the social I think all the studies that the academies do, social sciences are tremendously important, but these are, are especially so. So I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the book covers of studies that have done, some recent, some done a, a little while ago, but they look at different aspects of this and cover some of the issues in terms of uh, poverty reduction. The, the person I really like this title because it also uses the word roadmap, uh, a roadmap to reducing uh, child poverty. It was a study actually that came out this year in 2019. It looked out, making we've learned about trying to reduce childhood poverty, uh, and how can we improve the programs that we have now in order to cut it in half over the, the next few years. The, uh, here's one called S Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Evaluating the Evidence to Define Benequit Adequacy. So it's looking at the programs that exist and trying to look at how well are they working, what are the changes that need to be made, to strengthen and improve them. These are all looking at issues in the United States. We have all of these same problems, not to the same degree, obviously, as developing countries, but we, we have considerable amount in our inner cities in particular and some of our rural areas dealing with all of these problems. Here's one that was done actually in the 1990s, measuring poverty, a new approach. Back then it was a new approach, but it shows you that even having the, the people who think theoretically about these issues can actually make suggestions and improvements in how they're applied in the, the real world. Uh, this one is Communities in Action, Pathways to Health Equity. This is a study that looked at a number of communities and the programs they had in the community to try to reduce the inequities uh, in health care among the individuals that lived there, particularly among the low-income individuals. And again, making rec evaluating what is working, what's not working, what are recommendations to, uh, uh, to improve them. Looking at actually in situations in other countries, this issue of increasing uh, income generating opportunities for subsistence farmers in, uh, in Africa, in, in East Asia, emerging technologies to benefit farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, this is another one done long ago in the 1990s when the United States government was debating the Congress, the reform of our welfare programs. And at the time, the, uh, the academies were asked to actually conduct a study evaluating welfare reform and, this, and making recommendations of what might be done uh, to make it better. Uh, you heard also a little bit in the last session about the issue of violence and the problems, particularly people at the bottom of the income ladder, study on preventing violence against women and children, uh, one on the role of science and technology innovation and partnerships of the future of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, as the Foreign Assistance Agency. Uh, of the U.S. government. So all of these are just some of the many policy studies, but of course there are other policy studies that deal with climate change, deal with dealing with natural disasters, dealing with international issues, as well as dealing with uh, domestic issues. Uh, and I really only use them as, as illustrations of how the science community can actually 
focus in part on studying, looking at what is working, what is not working in terms of government policies and how they're implemented and, and what they're achieving. The, uh, let me just talk just a little bit about uh, STI for SDG roadmaps. Uh, I'm still involved to, to some extent at the, at the United Nations with an effort that I think is very important and one I hope I can interest you to pay some attention to. The, uh, there have been a number of what are called expert group meetings in 2018 and 2019 uh, that involve, they've actually been led by the World Bank and the government of Japan, but it involves other governments, it involves a number of the, uh, the UN agencies and other international organizations. And this effort is actually to try to provide a guidebook to countries who are interested in, pre in preparing a national STI for SDGs roadmaps. So what does that really mean? It's a, it's a roadmap for how the country itself is focusing its capabilities, science, technology, innovation to address whatever is in their national action plan, but in particular the aspects that relate to the sustainable development goals. And the, the reason why the people I work with at the World Bank that think this is important they see if they can get the attention of the finance ministers and the prime ministers on how to make their own expenditures, what the government itself spends on its development programs, to make them more effective, to be evaluated better, to get more input from the science and technology community. Countries, even with what they spend in their own funds, uh, can do it much more effectively than is the case uh, today. Just to give you one interesting example, the, uh, I used to believe very strongly that even countries at the bottom of the ladder should significantly increase their funds for research and development. I think some of the work that's been shown in the analysis, you have to build the institution at the same time. If you just increase the funding for research and development without building the institution that go along with it, uh, the returns really are not going to be there. The, uh, anyway, with the status of this guidebook, there is another expert group meeting that's going to occur in Nairobi in April. Uh, there's this multi-stakeholder STI forum that occurs now every year at the UN. It's going to occur this year in the middle of May. A revised draft is going to be presented there. Uh, the final version is going to go to the high-level political forum at the UN in July and to the General Assembly uh, in September. I just uh, reviewed the draft that's going to the, uh, the April meeting. I think it's really very good. So I think it'll probably be even stronger when the final versions come out. So I would recommend it when, that you, if you're interested, that you look at it when it's available. And in thinking about uh, issues for the science communities in the country, in Brazil and, and other places, the Inter-Academy Partnership, the kind of issues it might focus on besides the policy studies, and I thought the study that the IEP did relating on food, nutrition, and agriculture was absolutely terrific. I hope they're able to find the funds to do more studies of that type. But they also may think about some of these very focused studies, for example, looking at uh, some of the issues that were unveiled in, the, in the, the, the talk in the previous sessions dealing with the, the safety net, providing the right evidence uh, relevant to countries at different levels of development so they can actually make a difference. The, uh, the out of the UN, there are many countries right now that are very much focused on what they see as the problems that are occurring from, uh, from these new technologies, and the, the instant reaction they have is we're going to have to regulate this to, to great lengths to make sure that uh, they're not problems. We have to reach the right balance in how we deal, maximize the opportunities, but uh, minimize and moderate the, uh, the downsides in the, in the challenges. I think this is another very fertile area. Uh, for the academies at the national level or the inter-academy partnership uh, to look at. The, uh, just m my last comments, just so I make sure uh, I don't forget this. You know, I think one of the, the biggest responsibilities of the science community at the global level is looking at the global constraints and how they apply, particularly on the environmental issues, the oceans, the atmosphere, uh, the forests, uh, et cetera. And the science community in each country has to do their job trying to help their governments and their people understand what is the obligation of their country to help do their part in terms of dealing with these uh, global challenges. Uh, and I 
in dealing with the, uh, the IPCC in the climate area, I think it's been a terrific partnership between the worldwide scientific community and the, and the governmental community. Uh, and there are others in bio biodiversity, for example. Uh, but these, I've, these types of partnerships in the science policy interface, I think, are, are essential. The, uh, before I I'll come back to that last one, this was a study that was done by the National Academies in 1999 called Our Common Journey. It was actually funded by an individual who came out of the oil and gas industry, believe it or not. He felt that uh, science and technology were absolutely key to reaching a sustainable future, and so he provided the funds, to, not the U.S. government, but he provided the funds to carry out this study, and, uh, which I think was uh, a landmark study in many ways. Uh, the title is actually a play on words. You may know about the famous Bruntman Report in, in, 19, in the 1980s called our common future, which really provided for many people the definition of sustainable development. Well, th this title, Our Common Journey, emphasizes that it really is a journey. And the, uh, the importance of the scientific community is sort of aiding uh, societies and governments in conducting this journey, making it a learning journey. So we, we actually to fix things that don't work and make progress uh, more rapidly. With the, uh, you know, there was a discussion, I guess, in the first day, or maybe the second day, about the SDGs is the, the glass uh, half full or half empty. I, I clearly think it is uh, half full. I think the SDGs are a great gift to the world. It's a great opportunity for the science community to show what it can do to, uh, to help their uh, societies and to provide help in this journey that we're undertaking. In terms of the science policy interface, you know, American football is different from the real football that occurs everywhere else. I certainly like the real football better than American football. But American football is what we call a contact sport because you know there's a lot of contact between uh, the players in American football. Well, the, the science policy interface is also a contact sport. The only way you can really make a difference in terms of affecting uh, societies, affecting governments, as you heard from Volcker in his talk, you really have to engage. You learn, have to learn how to communicate, both using the media, whatever tools are available. You have to learn what the needs are in the way that the politicians and decision makers, as well as other important stakeholders in society, uh, talk about issues. So let me go back. This is an issue that Volcker raised in his talk as well, which I think is one of the, the major challenges for science communities everywhere. It's only a challenge for the science community in the United States. How can we do a better job engaging with all stakeholders in society, the private sector, the government, civil society, players, Subnational governments, vulnerable groups, professional societies, not only talking to them, but also listening to them, learning how to communicate better, learning how to engage better, and hopefully also to build sort of joint action plans through partnerships while we try to affect the, the positive change that, uh, uh, that we all desire. The, uh, oops, I've gone the wrong way. I just wanted to show my last slide, mention I'm an editor-in-chief of a little journal called Science and Diplomacy. It's not an academic journal. Academics don't get uh, tenure based on publishing in it, but it's really a journal for practitioners. It's all uh, available for free on the web. It comes out quarterly, but it tries to bring people together who work both from science and who work on international issues and diplomacy uh, to talk both about things that have worked in the past and the differences that uh, both science diplomacy can make and also moving up along this journey. Thank you. Thank you, William Coglesia. Uh, you know, we are just learning a lot with these talks on how to interact with policy. Uh, uh, now uh, we will listen to Rashid Bajwa from the National Rural Support Program. And here's your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's been a great experience and a bundle of thanks to the Brazilian Academy of Sciences to have invited me over. So we've been heard, hearing uh, uh, the last speaker about uh, again coming back to where the SDGs are half full or half empty. To me, it's a big jug, it's not a glass. And then you have to have multiple small glasses and then see whether it is half full or half empty. 
And uh, I would like to come back uh, and bring the discussion uh, when we started from day one. And I think it's a great opportunity to sum up everything and, uh, and try to see that what could be the science policy interface uh, and bring some live examples uh, from uh, my own country and to showcase uh, what is it that developing countries, poor countries can do in terms of uh, achieving what we are trying to do here. So with, uh, with this, uh, this is a little illustration of what is poverty and particularly income poverty. And, uh, uh, oops. So if you don't have any money to spend, and we, we heard this boys talking uh, in the earlier session, and I think this is the biggest issue here. And uh, in order to do so, uh, income poverty is at the household level. And uh, unless and until the focus is on the household, uh, it's very difficult uh, to do anything. And uh, in my country, the policymakers finally accepted it, that in terms of uh, looking at poverty, it's very important to reach each household. For developing countries in Asia, Africa, uh, everywhere else, it's important to reach down to the household. And uh, so, the, so the key is how do you reach to the household and work with the family to increase the incomes? Because, and in order to do that, uh, there are two examples which happened uh, in my country, Pakistan. One was uh, setting up of this program, the national program, which it is a parastatal program <clears throat> where the government comes in and provides a $10 million endowment and, and tells us, don't come back to us again. This is the money you have. Go and do whatever you have to do it. And this was a grant which was given. And... Uh, and then later on, starting uh, a national cash transfer program, uh, the Benazir Income Support Program in 2008. And I'll explain what has happened as a result of these two programs uh, with evidence. Uh, so, uh, so the program was uh, really to create a system of grassroots governance. And I'll explain what it is. And the hypothesis is, which we started was that Poor households individually cannot do anything. But if they organize, they pool their resources, then you can create some economies of scale. And in order to do that collectively, they get a better chance. And uh, so what we do is that we start with a household, we organize them at a neighborhood level, and there could be multiple such organizations uh, in a village. So we have about 400,000 such organizations and all the office bearers, the green boys, they actually network at a higher level, at the village level, they form a village organization and then there are multiple village organizations and all the villages within a small municipality, as we call it, they set up another tier, which is the uh, third tier, a local support organization. As a result of that, over time we have organized 7.5 million households out of 20 million rural households. So that comes to about 40% of the entire rural population of my country. Now, once this step was taken, it allowed us to go to each of these blue guys and ask a simple question. What is it that you can do to improve your life? and why you haven't been able to do that. And the why, the answer to why becomes the program. And the most important thing in rural areas, in developing countries, I know of South Asia as well, because this model has been uh, replicated in India under the National Rural Livelihood Mission. Uh, the program was started with UNDP funding under the South Asia Poverty Alleviation Program. So when it went in, so this question of why people have not been able to achieve what they wanted to do becomes the program. And one of the biggest thing which people are keen is to have finance money available because they can't access capital to undertake activities they want to do. And that allowed us to then design the country's largest microfinance program. At the moment, we are uh, 
providing loans to 1.2 million households, about $650 million worth of microfinance services going on. And these are all rural households. So this is a very interesting difference from what Grameen and other microfinance programs are doing, that it is going for small farmers. Most of the, obviously, people living in rural areas are farmers. And so you create an agriculture credit program as a result of that. On the other side, the other program, the cash transfer, this was established uh, by the World Bank, and the tool was used, which was the proxy means testing. So this is where the science interface came in. And it was all designed digitally. And uh, you'll be happy to know that uh, the, it was the Brazilians who came to Pakistan and gave us how to do it. And I think Brazil doesn't know about it, but it was Brazil who helped Pakistan to do that. And the program covers 6.5 million households at the moment. And a $15 grant is given. And every year, the government of Pakistan is providing about a $1 billion worth of uh, grants going into these uh, 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 poorest of the poor households. The other difference is that this money goes only to female of a household. And uh, so that also makes all, a lot of difference. And what we see also here is that it is because the data is digitalized, so you, so you can get the results very quickly. Now, while this happened, there was this bolt from the blue. And the bolt was that someone from the World Bank did a survey and they found out that there's an exceptional decrease in income poverty in Pakistan. And it fell from 35% to 10% or less. So everybody went into disbelief. So it can't happen. How can it be happen? And uh, so, so there was this uh, report which was published. And there was also political reaction of disbelief. People said, what is it? How can it happen? How is it possible? Data can't be incorrect. And what will the media say? Well, what happened was that the political government could not believe that you know, the poverty has go, gone down that rapidly. And they said that if we showcase it, you know, the media will come back to us and say, you are, you are lying. This can't happen. So what they did was, they said, let's call the author. So the author was called, so this is Ghazala Mansouri. And then this lady, she's a lead economist in the World Bank. She did this. She graphed all the four provinces. And she actually found out that income poverty has reduced to single digit in the country. Um, so. Everybody should have been happy. Nobody was happy. And the reason was that everybody was stunned. And I think the Brazilians must take credit for what they've done. They, they did the trick. And of course, the whole structure of the NRSP, the national program, was already there and disallowed that. Now, when that happened, um, some, something came to our rescue. And, and the rescue was the SDG index. And the index actually showed that we were, uh, if you look at the SDG number one, you can see that we are achieving almost 100% up there, the income poverty. But for the rest, we were far behind. So we were at the global rank uh, in 2018, 126. We have reduced it now, but we are still there. So that, that brought us some, some kind of consonance to the, to the policy makers. So here was a case where there was a great thing which has happened in income poverty, and everybody tried to shy away from it, and because they didn't want to commit themselves and, and showcase that what has happened in the country. So, um, but the policymakers were then forced to look at the multidimensional poverty and the other SDGs, and uh, there was a quick realization that there's a difference between income poverty and multidimensional poverty. And this, and the, and the realization was that income poverty is actually a private good. It is between the household, within a household. And the rest of the, all the indicators 
are actually public goods. So I will now explain to you that how we divide these two between income and uh, public and private goods and see how this interplay happens and what are the policy implications as a result of that. Um, the problem with public goods is that the government keeps investing. So the indicator for the government is more budgetary allocations, more expenditures, and this will solve the problem. We heard in day one when somebody said that uh, education expenditure as part of GDP in Brazil was 6%, and as a result, but we were not looking at the education outcomes. Similar is the case here. Pakistan has committed that we will have 4% of expenditure in, the, uh, in education. But what is, where is the receiving mechanism? And the problem is this. The problem is that there is a divide. And this divide between the people and the government. And the government services are available now. I think in, not only just in South Asia, but in other countries as well. It's not that the services are not available. These services are not doing what we call the last mile connection. The services are not reaching to the poor. And so the difference is something which needs to be done. Now that doesn't come with additional investments in any particular area. It comes with actually social engineering and how to link the society with the services which the government is offering. And this is the biggest takeaway to me in understanding that, uh, that public policy investments we have every country has done whatever they could and more of the same is not going to help now we have to look at the other side of it the receiving side of it and see how do we can club it so in order to do that uh, we did an experiment and we used uh, science and technology to bridge the gap and we said let's not let's just take some of the few key uh, problems in water, sanitation, immunization, and education. We call it a WISE program. And uh, uh, we used digital data uh, through smartphones. And we then trained local female workers because we had this three-tiered structure, which I explained to you. So we knew how to network and go into the networks of communities. And we were able to capture baseline data on a census basis, which means every village, every household in a village, all villages within a, a, a municipality. And it was done on M Android. And then using the 4G SIMs, the data has been uploaded on, on the servers. So this dashboard looks like that. And anybody can go up and look at this. You can click into that, and you will go in and see it live. It's a live da data which is, which is happening even today. It's, it, it's uh, 24 hours live. Now, so, so, so what the data has done is that the data is with the receivers of the services, the communities. And that data, suddenly people have started realizing that what is it that they need? And there is, that is creating a demand for the services. And then lobby for the services with, the, with actual evidence. And this is also very important. You go to local uh, uh, health providers and do, you go to uh, local school management, like uh, education uh, uh, managers there, and they will say, oh, no, everything is fine. But then you give them the data that, look, so many teachers are missing, so many students are not coming. This is evidence, and this is all digital with us. We have done this base, baseline. On most of the cases, they get defensive and then they are forced to provide the services. Most of the services, by the way, are already available, but people are just lazy. They're not providing the service for which they're getting paid. So we took a small sample. Pakistan is a big country, 200 million people. So for us, 100,000 households were a small sample, and we did that, and there was this evaluation for it. Within one year, we have been able to see um, the clean water, in two districts where we did this. And you can see the results. Uh, and this can happen perhaps in any developing country, that within one year, you can really change the way uh, services are available. Uh, 
for immunization, uh, for poli polio vaccination, it's almost 100%. Polio was the bigger, biggest problem, uh, as was pentavalent vaccines. And, and just by using this interface, this platform, you can see that, uh, that very high level of coverage as compared to the baseline has been done for immunization. Uh, for sanitation also, like uh, solid waste and latrines and sweeper coverage. And the biggest uh, thing, uh, the, the biggest gain was in education, particularly girl ch children. Because these women who have these Android platforms now, if there is a child who doesn't go to school, then this lady can go to the mother and ask, why is the, the child not going to the school? And uh, the very imp another very important lesson was that this has been done by females. And the reason is that the female can actually go uninterruptedly into the house uh, when the men, men are away uh, in the fields or they're working. So, it's, so, so the development to me will perhaps in developing countries will come through females and through the local females. And there are now enough youngsters who can easily be trained uh, to capture this data and to use this data. And so you can see that at a very high level, about 73% uh, or 62%. So this was it. So this is the last slide. That What are the lessons learned that, uh, that that's, you know, science and technology, we can, this can be a key instrument in creating an impact in policy, public policy, uh, especially in the context of key SDGs, provided we know that we have to divide the SDGs into public and private goods. And the private good is the perhaps the easier part. I think income poverty uh, uh, with the uh, unconditional cash transfers program and with this whole organization, the social mobilization as we called it, it's not difficult for countries to achieve it. Uh, so so that, that is the easier part. The, the complex part is the multidimensional poverty, the access to services, and that is where data and science comes in and interfaces with this, uh, with this whole paradigm. And so what has happened is that, that this evaluation one year work has actually, we have started talking to the provincial governments because the country has four provinces and every province is almost autonomous in terms of its SDGs. So we're talking to each provincial government to adopt this and then use this data as a tool to influence policy and get them to uh, assign relevant people to, to bridge the gap which I showed you. Now, the biggest uh, takeaway is that it doesn't require any additional funds. And the, and, and the policy makers at the provincial level, the secretaries, the head of the departments, they were also stunned to know that so much of money is being spent and so little is the outcome. The same 6% GDP versus, and so where is, where is the problem? And uh, so, but obviously the policy maker will only understand if he bring back data which is credible, evidence, and which is, not only relevant, but it is also uh, scalable. And the important thing is that if you come with a small NGO, they want to do a little work in a little area, they're not interested. They want to know how many districts and how many millions of people we can uh, access with this. So it's very important that when we talk to policy, one of the biggest take to, to understanding is that Talking to policymakers, I've been uh, in the government myself, and I know for sure that uh, uh, when I was a district commissioner and people would come to me, I would not be interested in a little small, uh, you know, work. I would be more keen to know that how much, how how how, how big the scale is, and that is that that was how I used to get interested in it. So it has to be scalable. So whatever the proposal is, that has to be scalable. And, uh, and the receiving mechanism is the household. The household is the key to the, to the answer to 
So this whole issue which we are trying to tackle. And uh, just to give you that uh, this uh, dashboard and the software, uh, we have invested in it and it is available free of cost to anyone who is interested. Any country, any place who wants to work with us will be happy to work with the Brazilian Academy of Sciences uh, as, a, as, a, as a kind of uh, our contribution to whoever is interested to use it and we will also provide the services behind it uh, to use it. Um, going forward, I think uh, this uh, three-day workshop, this, this conference here, I think it's very important that the Science Academy also starts thinking about uh, uh, doing regional uh, conferences on this issue. I think it's very important to me, uh, and this is the second part of what you were trying to look at, that I think it's very important that regional networks are established and the same issue is discussed at regional levels. The second important thing is uh, I have fascinated the, at the infrastructure which Brazil offers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for your talk. It's uh, very inspiring, very moving as well. You know, it's uh, it's a combination of the rational science, scientific evidence, but you know, it is moving as well to see this working. Very moving. Uh, so, would you please go to the podium so that we can answer the question? You can answer the questions. <laughs> So uh, William Cograzer has to leave now because it has to take his plane. So I just want to thank you for your contribution. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we had this, I mean, I found it a very nice session, very nice session, uh, showing, you know, in very concrete terms what science can do uh, for society and much especially what science can do for these SDGs. Uh, so fantastic, thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, and uh, I would like to, you know, without further delay, I would like just to ask uh, the public for, for questions. Yeah, too busy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all because it was fantastic to be here. But uh, my question uh, is about the way we look through science and society. I was a teacher in the university, now I'm re retired, but I'm still working. And I think every time I have my students and they ask me some questions, I, I, I think that we are far from the society. And I've, I've, I've think much about a uh, uh, way of doing things. And I think this conference had teach me a lot, but the way they, you do is mostly um, bottom down. And I would ask you if you could be bottom up and how we can do that. I think that uh, we have some ways of doing communication through the news, the newspapers, the big, big uh, 
magazines and the word and the media and the social media. But I think there are some strategies that I, we can do that force the people to think about. And one of them is to, to for instance, it's a suggestion to make a, a type of uh, contest, a contest on, on projects. And I, I used to think about this all this time of this conference, because this is a, uh, something that I have been working on it. And, and, and the contest would be, uh, if you think so, of two types, a, a science invention contest for the science people, for the academ academies, and another one for the traditional knowledge and for the N -O NGOs. And I think you should put the SDGs as a contrapartida, how do you say this? Cont contrapart, because these are a way of making the SDGs uh, popular, because everybody who wants to go to the contest must know about the SDGs. And another way of counterpart would be that it's not a one-person contest. It was a team contest, a, a transdisciplinary team contest. And of course, these are two things that we need to put on the society the SDGs and the transdisciplinarity, the team, the collective, the things that goes together. So I think, you do think that this could be done? That's my question. Okay, so let's have the question by Tundizi as well. Yes, first I would like to compliment the speakers. Very nice conferences, very stimulating conferences. And uh, I have a general question for you. Um, I was very interested in your talk, uh, Dr. Rashid, from Pakistan, but all of them, also all of the conferences were very, very important. What is the effectiveness of uh, national programs of social support to local uh, programs of uh, social support to uh, develop programs for reducing inequalities, because there are, uh, these are either bottom up or top down. I would like to know your experience of the inefficiency or in the efficiency of the national or local programs regarding these uh, questions, okay, this, uh, this effectiveness. Okay, thank yeah, you, thank I'll you. take a third uh, question. Well, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure hearing this session. I think it shows exactly why science is important for the SDGs. I think we had a very interesting different levels of coordination from the global to the national that shows that the SDGs target won't be met if science isn't there. So I think this was very stimulating. But however, I think it also showed how little even us from science and from this know about each other and know about these efforts. So I think there must be something that we have to do to have a, a coordination of coordinations so that we can really look at each other and try to see which are the scalable uh, good experiences we have. Um, I think that the, the, the role of the Academ Academy of Science of IAP and of the International Council for Science are vital because they really coordinate global science. So perhaps from this here we could suggest something. <laughs> I don't know what exactly, what was the form, but really having something that would put all this wealth of very interesting and successful experiences where, I mean, I think that the, the last talk was fascinating. 
an unattended positive <laughs> uh, consequence of having a very universal pro program suddenly result in a real impact in poverty. So, uh, and what I liked also very much was that, especially on your case and in some others also, it was shown that policy only works if you have the right target. And the right target is gendered. So sometimes, if you don't use sex and gender as a, as a vision, as a lens, you lose. And I think that your program showed very much that you had the right target. Okay, so I have three uh, questions and comments, and I think they are addressed to uh, everybody here. So, uh, you know, uh, who wants to answer first? Let me comment on the questions about trust of society versus science. The biggest problem we have is really to convince people that we will help them in all the problems existing. And I give an example for vaccination. My background is medicine and pediatrics, and we notice that worldwide the number of vaccination is going down. And in the history of medicine, the invention of vaccines is the biggest you know, uh, thing we have ever had so far. And still we see now, in particular in countries where there are you know, a lot of wealth, like in Europe, for example. And these are the, the mothers who, who object that uh, it, the child should be immunized because nature should take it, case, uh, it, it, it cause and uh, a natural infection is much better than all these artificial infections. As I say, intelligent women, they, most of them belong to the Green Party. They are, have, have a university degree and they still object. And you can try what you want. It is almost impossible to convince them. And I think they will only learn, learn the lesson. This is very unfortunate when there's an epidemic, like in Germany now, like in France. France has, has made compulsory immunization. I will not go into any more detail. I will only show you that it is so difficult to get to, to, to society. And if I look into the European population, which are basically against gene-modified crops, right, in contrast to your country here, right, I hope and my wish is always that social sciences helps us to do studies and find out why us they, they are against it. Maybe they can buy everything which is available for relatively less money. If they would you know, live in a different country where they would, would starve, they would probably do this. But I'm, I, I, I cannot g give you an answer to this question. There is so, there's so many ways of you know, interaction. I think we should not give up. This is the only thing I know. We always should try. But there is no blueprint, you know, which which we can follow. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to comment briefly on on the first two questions. Um, maybe I'm turning the first question around a little bit um, with regard to the issue of engagement with the public or public engagement with science. So I'm not referring here to communication and the like. But the issue for me is the following, and it's very closely related to what Foucault was saying a moment ago. Um, what is our role, what is our responsibility with regard to engaging with the public in such a way that the public understands um, what science is all about? How does science work, okay? Uh, what do we mean as scientists when we say we, we have a consensus view on something, or there is uncertainty uh, underlying this or that decision. These, of course, are points that are eagerly seized upon by those who take an anti-scientific view. What is our role? How do we go about ensuring that young people, but, but really people of all ages, are in a position to make an intelligent assessment of the situation regarding vaccination or what climate change is really all about. How, how, do, they, how do they assess in, uh, online, uh, in the internet, or through social media, 
what is fake news, which can be pre presented in, in a very subtle way, which makes it very difficult to make assessments. So I, I don't have easy answers to that, but certainly for the International Science Council, that is a major objective of ours. I have no time to talk about that here. We need to engage with the public in order that we have a, a public that is educated in the sense that it can assess and make these decisions well. With regard to the, the, the second question, um, I think that partnerships are extremely important. Now, and partnerships in different ways. Um, again, um, it's almost taken for granted and needs to be that whatever the problems, we need to work across the natural sciences and technology and the social and behavioral sciences in order to tackle these problems. Furthermore, and this is where certainly the International Science Council has some work to do, um, we have good partnerships with academies and, and science bodies and that sort of thing. Our partnerships with the private sector are um, almost embryonic, I would say. We have a long way to go. Likewise with NGOs, with, with other organizations, so that you have really a broad network of um, individuals and organizations that can engage effectively in, in addressing these issues, and very much in, in a bottom-up way, uh, and in an inclusive way. Well, coming back to the whole business of inclusivity, whether one is talking about uh, a region of the world or marginalized communities, marginalized by gender, race, or whatever, one has to be sure that you are maximally inclusive. Yeah, this question about uh, federal versus provincial and local, I think this is a very a critical question. And uh, to me, uh, as you go down, uh, there are some very good, well-intentioned organizations wanting to work. Uh, but unfortunately, they need help. Uh, they, and they need systems. They need strengthening. And they, they need what we call technical assistance. To, but, but there is a will. And it's very important. And this is part of the policy, uh, with, at least with us, that we have to use the local organizations. Uh, so if, if, if you look at what are the key, three key areas, one is work with local organizations. If they need funding, support, technical assistance, provide them. Provide it. They are in harmony with what we want to achieve. This is very important. There should be clear-cut uh, objectives and understanding on that. The other very important is that in future, it is the female who is going to be the engine of future development. Unfortunately, it's not going to be male. And I mean, and this is how uh, things are going to work. Um, we have seen that wherever we involve females, they become more responsive. They are focused more on the family and the child rather than anything else. And so it is critical that that female gets an independent income source, independent of the husband so that then she can invest in the child. And the third critical area is that we talk about childhood stunting and we are talking about malnutrition. Is there any mother on this earth who will not feed a child? So question is not that the mother doesn't feed the child. The mother would prefer not to eat, but will make sure that the child is fed. The problem is because of contaminated water, and I'm talking because I am a public health person myself, that the ability of the child to absorb the nutrients from the intestine into the blood because of contaminated water is inhibited. So there's a barrier. So the key to malnutrition in this country and key to childhood stunting actually is clean water. And it is very important that policymakers start looking at it. Unfortunately, 
water is not part of the health sector in many countries, including mine. So drinking water is by a, another ministry and health is by another ministry. So they don't talk to each other. And so, so this is the disconnect. And the sooner the world understands this small issue, I think childhood, childhood malnutrition and stunting, we can overcome it without investments. Because otherwise, you know, UNICEF talks about this nutty biscuits and everybody is pushing money and funding billions of dollars for ch malnutrition, but it's not working. And the reason is what I've explained. So it's basically a public health issue which needs to be solved. Coming back, um, for the, for science and policy, the science has to create evidence. And whichever way it does, whether it is through journals, whether it is through digital means or whatever, but it's very important that that evidence is created and that is, it is the only tool through which we can change the policy. And in order to do that, as I was telling uh, earlier, that it's very important that this initiative uh, actually continues in some form, as you were, as some of, some, someone asked that, what's, what next? Where should we want to go? And I think this kind of a regional consultations have to take place uh, uh, based on what these three days of discussions have happened. Well, I have some final words. I will stand up because uh, I'm a professor, so, you know, <laughs> I'm used to uh, teach like that. And <laughs> if I sit down, I almost cannot speak, you know, it's a, it's a kind of instinctive reaction. So, you know, I just want to uh, say some final words of, of thanks and also uh, about uh, future plans. And uh, uh, so I'll start with the future plans. Uh, I talked with uh, uh, some people here before. I talked with Volker about this. And of course, uh, after this wonderful conference, people ask naturally, what else? <laughs> Where do we go from here? So uh, we do have plans. And uh, we together with the uh, international scientific organizations, uh, to organize regional workshops, inviting representatives of the society to participate. Now, you remember that in the beginning of uh, this uh, session, I, I just gave the example of the fourth national conference on science and technology and innovation for a sustainable development. We had people from several sectors of society. And, and the, the, the conclusions, you know, to my surprise, we had this blue book which was a consensus, consensus, you know, between <laughs> syndicates, uh, uh, businessmen, uh, scientific community were able to distile uh, the, 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 the words and the projects that were a consensus. Uh, and and uh, it was a fantastic experience. And, and I think, you know, we should keep that in mind. That was bottom up. That was bottom up. The blue book, that resulted from that conference was bottom up. The government participated in the debates, but you know, it did not command. It was, it was an organization from the society, which took some months to do. And, but you know, I think we should try to do that and have regional workshops. You know, we had these uh, food security workshops, but of course, if it comes to uh, science for, uh, 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 reducing poverty and, and inequality. I think um, we, we might have help from other actors. I s we had lots of social scientists here, and I think Foker uh, said it very well, you know. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> we need you uh, to help our communication society and to also try to understand some new things that have been happening in several countries. Uh, you know, flat, planet, flat earth, you know, uh, uh, denial of the science of climate, uh, denial of natural selection. How can we understand that? You know, and that I think is a very interesting problem for social sciences to understand what are the connections there. How come, you know, in this century, in the 21st century, we have this upsurge of uh, of uh, obscure uh, thoughts, uh, and, and what is this? 
And we need social science for that, and we need social science also for help us to communicate with the public. So I think these are challenges we have. We had fantastic examples in this last conference, and I really thank you very much for, for giving these examples to us. Of course, they are leaders, <laughs> leaders of the community, of the scientific community. We have an achiever uh, that actually was very successful in implementing a very daring uh, social program. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, you know, we are closing this conference with a uh, gold key uh, uh, through, your, through the things you, you told us. And I'd like to thank, you know, and now I have a list of people here, so be patient. <laughs> but they, they deserve your patience. So I'd like to thank the people who made this conference uh, possible. First of all, the speakers uh, and the chairs, excluding myself. Uh, so without you, of course, this conference would not happen. Uh, second, the public, with their questions, with their curiosity, with their participation in the discussions. Also, uh, the public was very helpful for this conference. And then the people who helped, who helped actually uh, intellectually and physically uh, this conference to happen. Uh, Elisa Hayes, who coordinate, who was the academic coordinator of the program. <laughs> Marcos Cortezão, who, was, who is our uh, executive secretary for foreign affairs, so he had also very good help doing that. Uh, Vitor Vieira, who gave the general support for this science. Is Vitor there? I see. Where is he? Where is him? Oh, he's organized the transfer, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think Vitor did not sleep, I don't know, because yesterday we were in the Museum of Tomorrow, and he had to come here to organize this session and all these uh, things there, and, uh, and, and actually I met, you know, in the, in the, during dinner, I met the, the people from the academy who were just waiting in the restaurant so they could come here after the show, they had a show here in this auditorium, and they, have, they had to wait the show to finish, in order to uh, set up this scenario. So, you know, very dedicated people. So, Vito Vieira gave the general support. Pedro Dantas was uh, the uh, one who uh, did this visual uh, uh, scenario here. He designed it okay? uh, with some very good insights onto the, you see the, the symbol of the, of the uh, SDGs with the two. Uh, symbols detached, that's the number one and the number uh, ten. So, uh, uh, Eliso, the, the people from the communication team, Elisa Osvaldo Cruz, Pedro Henrique Carvalho, Manuele Caputo, Clarissa Machado, four people who help us to communicate with the general public and with the press. Uh, the people charged with the audiovisual support, Anderson Pontes, I think Anderson is hidden there, uh, behind the computer, uh, Glauber Bordalo also uh, helping us. Okay. They're, they're working uh, now, uh, they're still working. Deborah Santana at the registration desk, I think you met her, she was you know, putting these things in, your, in our arm, controlling the registration. Uh, Fernando Verissimo and Gabriela Mello. Fernando Verissimo is around, where is he? Fernando? Ah, there, there he is, yes. He's my uh, chief of cabinet, that's it, right? He knows my agenda better than me. So I have this uh, joke with my wife. She doesn't like it, you know. She asks me, so, Luis, uh, can we go to see a movie Friday night? Then I tell her, well, we, I, do, I don't know, you know, ask Fernando Verissimo if, <laughs> if I am free. <laughs> so, and, and, uh, and, and then Maria do Carmo Santos, who, ha, who did the backstage support. She was bringing the water, the, you see. So, you know, it was like, you know, I think I counted here 13 people. We have 18 people in the staff. So you see, it was a kind of war operation. You know, everybody was coming to help uh, as they could. So thank you very much for your support. I want to thank also the National Bank for Economic and Social Development for, uh, for this uh, amphitheater. They actually gave us this space without charging for it. So very generous uh, offer. Uh, and I think it, actually the subject of this conference is a subject which is very relevant for, this, uh, uh, for, the, for the theme of this bank, you know, 